Good evening, good evening, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time out to join the Association of General Practitioners of Jamaica in collaboration with Apotex, innovating for patient affordability. Uh, this wonderful 2022 World Diabetes Day webinar. I will not hold you up. I'll hand you over to the capable hands of the wonderful Dr. Aldith Buckland, who will be our moderator for this evening's wonderful session. Please enjoy and have fun. Over to you, Dr. Buckland. Thank you very much, Sam. Thank you very much. Good evening to everyone who have chosen to be with us at this AGP Caramed Apotex World Diabetes Day webinar, November 14, 2022. At this time, I invite, um, I invite our sponsor to come and tell us a bit about themselves. And then after that, I'll give some opening remarks and prayer. Over to our sponsor. Never quit until success is achieved. Dr. Barry Sherman, founder, Apotex. Each day, thousands of employees across the global Apotex network share the sentiment of our founder embodied by our shared purpose to improve access to innovative, affordable, and high-quality medicines for patients around the world, our workforce of scientists, chemists, engineers, experts in quality and regulatory affairs, and many other functions demonstrate their collective passion for the patients we are privileged to support. To deliver on this purpose, we have created a vertically integrated business comprised of generic medicines, biosimilars, and a division dedicated to the production of active pharmaceutical ingredients. Our strong pipeline is fueled by a world-class in-house R&D capability and supported by robust co-development partnerships and business development deals. Manufacturing operations at Apotex span across four countries, Canada, the United States, Mexico, and India, with a global manufacturing capacity of more than 20 billion tablets and capsules. The majority of dosages are produced in Canada. With a flexible supply chain, leading edge technology and technical expertise, our operations are always audit ready and approved by the FDA, Health Canada and other major regulatory authorities. We produce hundreds of products in thousands of different dosages and formats, including 
finished solid dose products, sprays, transdermal, and more. We export these to more than 100 countries and territories and operate in dozens of countries. As a leader in healthcare, we recognize our obligation to give back to society. We demonstrate this through our philanthropy, investments in academia, donation of medicines to organizations in need, and with our community support. While we have achieved much since we began in 1974, challenges in healthcare still remain. So we keep the words of our founder front and center. Never quit until success is achieved. Apotex, a proudly Canadian global pharmaceutical company, innovating for patient affordability. Thank you so much for that sponsor's presentation. Now, World Diabetes Day is a very interesting concept of the World Health Organization. And it is celebrated on November the 14th each year. The theme of this year is access to diabetes education. And this underpins access to care. Um, WHO highlights not only the challenges, but more, more importantly, the solutions to scaling up access to diabetes medicine and care. Did you know that the logo for World Diabetes Day is a blue circle? It's called the blue circle um, because this is a global symbol for diabetes awareness. And it is the logo of World Diabetes Day. And we can wear blue, we can, sh um, just like how we wear the poppy pin and the pin for breast cancer, we can wear blue to highlight and bring awareness to diabetes. This, it was a circle because in many cultures, um, a circle symbolizes life and health. And uh, more importantly, the circle symbolizes the unity, the unity that is necessary to combat such a deadly NCD. So right now we will go into prayer and ask the Lord's blessing on our webinar. Lord, as we treat our patients, help us to be wise. Let us see their problems through your discerning eyes. Guide us, Lord, and help us as we learn some more tonight so that lives will be impacted in a positive way energetic light. Amen. So at this time, I'm going to welcome Dr. Donald Gordon, the president of the Association of General Practitioners, to bring the welcome. Dr. Gordon. Are you hearing me? Yes. Very good. Hi. Hi. Good night, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, colleagues, moderators, Dr. Alit, presenters, our valued sponsors, Apotex, and its staff, the members of the Secretariat, and the technical team. I'm Dr. Gordon, President of the Association of General Practitioners of Jamaica. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to today's webinar, which is staged in recognition of World Diabetes Day. As we all know, diabetes has become a scourge of modern life with an ever increasing prevalence worldwide. World Diabetes Day turned the spotlight on the education, prevention, and the management of complication of diabetes. We in the association are pleased to collaborate with Apotex to highlight this growing problem as well as to point to possible solutions. To inform us more about the scope and complication of the problems and to provide us with the knowledge and the clinical tools to achieve these goals, we are pleased to welcome two very eminent speakers, Dr. Patrice Edwards Emanuel and Dr. Jackie Campbell. As an association whose members are in the forefront of the management of this very thorny problem, it is a pleasure to jointly bring this webinar to our members, which will not only highlight the problem, but hopefully will also point us to solution. 
As an association, we are proud and we're always trying to put on educational meetings, educational meetings for the benefit of our membership. We trust that you, the audience, will enjoy and participate fully in this evening's presentation. We trust the knowledge and information imparted will assist us in our practice to make better decisions in the management of what is a growing and exploding medical problem. Thank you very much. And back over to you, Dr. Aldit. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Donald. All right, at this time, I invite Mrs. Judith McBean to, um, to present, to bring greetings from the sponsor. Over to you. Okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Judith McBean and I'm the supervisor for the Apotex team. I know you've already received a very warm welcome from Dr. Gordon, but I wanted to add my welcome on behalf of Apotex. Apotex is a Canadian global pharmaceutical company distributed by Carimed Group Limited since 1986. Our purpose is improving access to medicines for millions of patients worldwide. We do this by providing affordable, innovative, and high quality solutions. Apotex exports to over 100 countries and territories, and our global footprint includes presence in the US, UK, Australia, and of course, the Caribbean. It is our pleasure to partner with AGPJ on this webinar to bring you greatly informative and educational presentations through this virtual medium. Look out for your Apotex questions in the chat after each spotlight for a chance to win some great prizes from us at different points during this webinar. Have a wonderful rest of the evening and I thank you. Back over. Thank you very much, Mrs. McBean. At this time, Sam asks you to put up the sponsor's video presentation, please. Thank you. Sit tight. Don't even take a bite. You don't want to miss the opportunity to win a prize in our Apotex Spotlight. Non-communicable diseases, notably cardiovascular diseases, are a major public health burden in Jamaica. People with no signs, symptoms, or even history of a cardiovascular disease can still be at risk for having a heart attack or stroke. According to the WHO, this lipidemia is a major risk factor for cardiovascular disease and is estimated to cause 2.6 million deaths and 29.7 million disability adjusted lives globally. A local study conducted in 2017 that included 500 patients revealed that 90% of these individuals had abnormal cholesterol levels. Today, I will be speaking on our Apotex products for cholesterol lowering, statins. Statins are HMG CoA reductase inhibitors used to lower lipid levels and reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease including myocardial infarction and stroke. According to the American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association, statins are considered first-line treatment options for dyslipidemia after lifestyle adjustments does not result in a desired therapeutic response. The increasing use of this class of drugs is largely attributed to the rise in cardiovascular diseases in many countries. Statins also possess pleiotropic properties including improved endothelial function, reduced inflammation at the site of the coronary plaque, inhibition of platelet aggregation, and anticoagulant effects. Let's take a look at our dyslipidemic solutions from our Apotex portfolio. We have our Apopravastatin, Aposimvastatin, and our Superstatins, Apoatorvastatin, and Aporosuvastatin. 
Here, we have a table showing our available statins with some key factors to consider while prescribing. For LDL cholesterol reduction, we can see that the Aporosuit statin offers the greatest reduction in LDL. However, other factors will determine if high, moderate, or low intensity statin is to be used. For example, if you have a patient who is polymedicated, aporosuvastatin or apopravastatin is recommended based on their limited cytochrome P450 metabolism. If said polymedicated patient has renal impairment, apoatorvastatin will now be recommended based on its limited effects on the kidneys. Other variables to consider when choosing a statin option for your patients are the solubility and presence of active metabolites. Apotex has the full range of statins, particularly noting the availability of the 5 and 40 mg in Rasuva statin that gives the prescribers flexibility to treat their patients for stroke, primary hypercholesterolemia, dyslipidemia, or just prophylactically to keep those cardiovascular conditions at bay. Why should you prescribe the APO? Well, one, you're assured of high quality. Our products are formulated to contain the same active ingredients and to produce the same beneficial effects as the originator they replicate. Two, you get affordability. Our products are at a price point that patients can afford. Three, accessibility. Our products are well distributed in all pharmacies island-wide. Four, our therapeutic range. We have a wide range of products in numerous strengths and forms. So please remember to add the APO prefix to ensure your patients receive a high quality, affordable pharmaceutical option. Have an apotastic day. Thank you so much, the, the uh, Apotex team. Yes, I think we'll really have a wonderful apotastic night. Yes, thank you so much for that sponsor's video presentation. And I hope that we made notes so you can win your spot prizes. At this time, I'll ask Mr. Dennis Williams, med rep from Apotex, to introduce the first speaker for this evening. Your turn. Good evening, everyone. The pleasure is mine to introduce one of our speakers for tonight, which is Dr. Jacqueline Campbell. She's a family doctor and a pharmacologist. She lectures at um, the UA, UA Mona campus in pharmacology, in pathophysiology, and complementary and, and, and alternative medicine as well. She supervises the research for undergraduate and graduate pharmacology student. She also is a newspaper columnist, writing several medical related articles in the Jamaica Observer. She's also a co-host on a radio program which promotes health education, specifically in complementary and alternative medicine. She's also an author and she wrote a book called A Patient's Guide to the Treatment of Diabetes um, mellitus. So with no further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Jacqueline Campbell, our very competent and accomplished speaker tonight. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'll just share my screen.
Yeah, we're seeing it. I would just need to click on slide. Oh, you see, there you go. I just need to do this. You know, I do this for lectures, but I don't know, maybe because I've seen so many people on. I'm not mm -hmm. sure. I'm not mm -hmm. seeing this thing here. I hope that. Hold Can on, you let do me... this for me, Sam? Yeah, you see that request does come in for remote control. Just give me remote control. Hold on, let's see if I can help. Yes, please. All right, let's see if I can help you here. Maybe we just need this just right go here. Just slide, slide show. Wonderful. Just need to go back, please. Here we are. Okay, you should back, be able back, to go back. now. You, you use your, you can use your keyboard and just do your thing. Yeah, man. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. So good evening again, <clears throat> colleagues and colleagues. Thanks to the organizers for inviting me to present on this particular topic, which is a topic which is dear to my heart, I would say, lifestyle management of diabetes in the general practitioner's office. And really the objectives here are really to go through that which uh, I, I suspect most of us do, but just to put it all together in one presentation. We already know that diabetes is a major public health problem and it affects so many people, all ages and right throughout the world. And what we need to always remember and remind our patients is that this disease, as Dr. Aldit has said, had said in her introduction, can lead to significant, she called it a deadly disease and it is, but I don't tend to use that word with my patient, this scares them. So let's just say it increases the mortality and the morbidity. And of course, very importantly, it reduces the quality of life. And we know that it progresses to significant, it causes significant complications, which I know the next speaker will be speaking about. Now, there are some challenges when we look at uh, diabetic patients who come to our offices. Their challenge daily to follow this complex set of uh, actions. They have to follow a meal plan. They will need to undertake, those who care to, undertake um, appropriate physical activity and they have to take medication. Some of them do, some of them don't. And this of course is uh, further complicated by the need to integrate all of these changes into their daily life. Now, when we look at lifestyle management, this is very fundamental to diabetes care. So we need to look at self-management education, self-management support, and of course, lifestyle modification. Now, when it comes to self-care, it's very important that patients realize that there are some things that they will have to do for themselves. Because we as practitioners, yes, we can speak, we can advise, we can prescribe, we can recommend, but the patient has to know that he or she has to do something for himself. And when we look at self-management, this, uh, this process involves active self-care as I just spoke about. And the goal is really to improve behaviors and of course, well-being. This would include, and I will be repeating myself, meal planning, planned physical activity, blood glucose monitoring, taking medications, monitoring blood sugar levels day in, day out. So you can see that it, it can be quite a burden for some patients. So in terms of diabetes self-management education, it is actually a collaborative process. And this, as it says on the slide here, is intended to facilitate development of knowledge, skills, abilities that are required for the successful self-management of diabetes. No, with the, the effective self-management, it's very crucial to motivate persons with diabetes because there are some 
why is this? We know already that there's some reasons for non -ad adherence to management recommendation, lack of motivation, as I just said, the absence of any support persons may be on their own, literally. They may be living by themselves. Let's just think of an elderly person who lives mm -hmm. alone. They don't have any support at all. And of course, there's some disease related implication. Fatigue, I put in, in brackets here. And when we talk about fatigue, we're talking about physical and emotional fatigue in particular. So I'm getting there. Education is very important. Education is fundamental when caring for people with a chronic disease like diabetes. So it comes now. I had a patient, 37 year old female. She came for a checkup and she reported that she has been feeling tired, eating more than usual, losing weight though, thirsty, passing urine frequently. You get the picture. She has been fired from her job because she had to get up frequently to urinate because of the uncontrolled diabetes. She doesn't smoke, doesn't drink alcohol, refused to exercise. And you can see here her BMI is nearly 38. She has a strong family history of diabetes. And of course, we see here where two close family members had Reese died prior to presentation. Her GMR 20 and her blood pressure 140, 90. When we did some blood, you can see her glyco-HB was 12.8% and her fasting blood sugar was 23 millimoles per liter. So you could see that this young lady had a little bit of, a little bit of a challenge there. So she was started on, let us say, appropriate medication. So what's the next step for this person? Sure encourage her to take her medication and of course she didn't want to go on insulin and you know the usual thing so what's the first thing for this person we have to take some time or what i did for her was to take time to educate her about the disease so it brings me now to this particular article which was um publishing yesterday's uh, um, Gleaner, and it's written by Dr. Alverston Bailey, entitled Being Educated is Critical to Diabetes Prevention. And I dare say the editor should have put critical to diabetes prevention and uh, management. And uh, moving right along here, some I'm just going to share some of what um, Dr. Bailey said. He had stated that the latest figures from the Ministry of Health and Wellness show that one in eight Jamaicans is living with diabetes, while one in four Jamaicans is, is unaware that they even have the condition. Very, very important. And while it says that these facts and figures are there, it is important that as healthcare professionals, we know how to detect and diagnose diabetes and very important here to me, make the most of the limited time that we have to provide the best possible advice and care for those persons living with diabetes. So the aim of diabetes education, so the article is really making a big plug for diabetes education. So the aim of diabetes education is to improve knowledge, health beliefs and lifestyle changes, improve patient outcomes. So we're looking at weight, glyco HB, et cetera, improve the quality of life, improve levels of physical activity. I shouldn't maybe it should have been have help people to even start some physical activity. And of course, here it says reduce reduction in the need for um, med some medications. It's also important, Dr. Bailey said that diabetes education programs be flexible to suit the needs of the individual. So it comes now to the components in diabetes management. Education is important. 
I had dietary, I changed it to dietary pattern adaptation, exercise, self-monitoring, smoking cessation, although there's a program where we are encouraging persons not to smoke or if they are smoking to stop smoking, we still have some diabetics who continue to smoke. So that's important. Stress management is very, very important. And I'll get into that a little later. And of course, there are the pharmacologic um, interventions. Now, when we look at the goals of management, I write here that normal is a good word. And we need to stress this to our patients that normal is a good word. So with the diabetic patients, we want normal blood glucose levels. I would suggest, and I know many of you suggest to the person, or emphasize, I should say, that if your blood sugar is normal, it means that you're going to be avoiding these high and low blood sugar levels, which can cause problems in that they are potentially harmful and, of course, can send you into a coma at this point when i tell people this is like a whoa coma yes which can be fatal we're looking at normal blood pressure normal cholesterol normal kidney function additionally when we look at the goals of management we're thinking of weight loss don't just tell the patient you know you need to lose weight we need to show them how to lose weight. So we need to devise some sort of plan to help these individuals. In terms of education, I like to say, keep it simple. So these are the headlines that I use in my practice when I'm speaking to patients. So we ask, I, I will go through them, what is diabetes? Or I like to ask them, I would say to them, well, you have been diagnosed with di as diabetic. What is your understanding of the disease? It's always interesting to me that many persons will say that they really don't know what it's all about. All they know is that they must take some tablets and they must eat, eat plenty of sugar. They can still eat sugar, have sugar. So we look at the types of diabetes, causes, symptoms, testing, controlling and treating diabetes, looking at all of these things that I have listed on, on this slide. Very important, talk about eye, mouth, and foot care. It's always fascinating to me, for want of another term, the number of persons who will tell me that they have never, ever been to the dentist they haven't been to check their eyes or anything like that. And of course, we talk about foot care and very, very important meal planning and portion control. So in terms of types of diabetes, we go through the usual here, the different types. I will do something simple because most of the patients are type 2 diabetics. I will say something like explain what this type 2 diabetes is is really about keeping it very simple and telling them that, for example, as we all know that type two is the most common form of diabetes and what exactly happens with type two diabetes. I also go through with those persons when it's essential, I go through what pre-diabetes is all about because it's important that people know this. There was somebody saying something. I don't know. Um, causes of diabetes. Also, what causes diabetes? We know that type one and type two have different causes, but that they share some things in common. And I'll explain to them what family history means. Because many times in my practice, the you have these clumps. Of, of persons, I don't think that's the right term to use, um, number of persons who will tell me that when I ask them, they say, you know, my granny had sugar, but she did. So that means that is not a family history anymore. So there's a misunderstanding about what family history really means. Um, what's happening here? 
not advancing. And then we have the environmental factors. And I speak to them about the risk factors for the development of diabetes. And I always- No, environmental factors. Okay. That, forget about that. That is me um, explaining what it's all about. We spoke, of, I also talk about symptoms of diabetes because some persons will come in with varying symptoms of diabetes and I will explain to them what these symptoms really mean. So if they're hung, hungry, what the implication of that is or why, why they are hungry. If the person urine a lot, what that, uh, what is the reasoning behind that? Yes, sure, I teach pathophysiology, but I don't go into the whole doctor, doctor explanation. We keep it very, very simple for persons. Now, also, what is important here is the fact that all diabetics need to have a glucometer. I always encourage my patients to get a glucometer. Tell them about NHF and so on. Get a glucometer. Why do they need a glucometer? They may ask because they don't want to stick themselves. And I will commiserate with them and say, you know what? I too would have a little bit of issue. I'm real with my patients if I had to stick myself, but I know that it is something that is if it is, is essential that you need to know what is happening in your body or with your body. For example, I'll tell them if you eat a particular food and I may say to you later on, I'll say, you may, you have to have a particular portion of this food. I want to know what your body is doing when you actually eat this particular food. And so you have to get into the habit of writing down your numbers. Also, I encourage diabetics to have a blood pressure monitoring machine so they can have an idea of what is happening with their bodies. And you know what I have found, and I'm sure many, many of you have noticed it, is that when the patients actually get into this, they will be writing down for like months, the, the fasting and the two hour blood sugar levels. I've had patients who have emailed me spreadsheets with their blood pressures, um, on a daily basis for like three months. So, you know, you do have patients who will take this very, very seriously. Now, when you look at controlling and treating diabetes, so this is, these are all things that I go through with my patients, controlling and treating diabetes. I tell my patients, you know, especially the persons with type two diabetes that uh, most of what needs to be done, you can do it by yourself. You just need some guidance. And of course, it's important that we involve their family. If they have any family that is our friends, our neighbors, or so on. So the goals of treatment, which I will be going through with the patients would be keeping the glucose levels within normal range. I remember I said, normal is a good word. And it's important, I would say to the patient that this is done to prevent any short-term and long-term complications associated with the disease. I had a patient today who said to me, well, I'm not really taking any medication. Now you know, because I know eventually, I know sometimes eventually something may happen. So I had to say to her, well, you're eventually maybe sooner than you are thinking, because although you are just, uh, let us say, 40 something, you're eventually maybe in a few months time. So she had to think about what I just said. And of course, improving the quality of life. 
So with the lifestyle changes that I talk about my to, about about to my patients, there's the eating plan, which we're gonna go go through. Weight control is very important. Regular physical exercise, smoking cessation, reduction in alcohol intake, very important. So we know that there are some persons who come in. And they, they will say to me, you know, but doctor really don't have much weight on. It's just that my belly fat. You know, you, we all know these, these patients. And, you know, I have to speak to them about, about the, the, the dangers of having a hazardous waste. So next, what, what I talk to my patients about would be high and low blood sugar levels hypoglycemia what does that mean again we have empowered them in terms of getting or obtaining a glucometer so let us say someone begins to feel sick i say to them you have to check your sugar levels get somebody to check your sugar levels to see what is happening? So we we'll let them know that, for example, what the blood sugar level should really be, the range of the blood sugar levels. So if it is, let us say, a blood sugar level is less than 3.8 millimoles per liter, that means you're hypoglycemic. What is it? You may be feeling shaky, you may be sweating, something or the other may be happening to you and what are the actions that need to be taken just um last week i had to be telling this gentleman's caregiver actually his neighbor um that uh, she should have checked his blood sugar level when he started to feel uh, sick and that she should uh, they should not be she said that she gave him some sugar and water and i, I had to tell her that if it happens next time and he's unconscious, she should not attempt to give him any sugar and water. So little things like that, we need to be telling persons. Again, two, hyperglycemia, high blood sugar. What is happening there? Um, what, are some of, what are some of the causes of high blood sugar? What are some of the symptoms that may be noticed and what are the actions to take so this is very important and that is why they need to have a functioning blood sugar machine as the patients call it a functioning glucometer one that they know how to use one that a family member knows how to use because many times as we know patients will have a, a glucometer and they say well it run out of the strip or they don't know to use it or something or the other. They need to know how to use the blood sugar machine, the glucometer, and how to interpret the results there. A patient said this to me some time ago. Doctor, maybe I'm too lazy because I had spoken to her. She's a well-known diabetic, has been diabetic for many, many years. And I was speaking to her about the importance of regular physical exercise. I like to keep it real with my patients, you know. I tell them, look here, I am not telling you that you have to go put on any shorts and jog on your road or anything like that. I'm not telling you to do that. Um, you, you can do some regular exercise by, for example, here we can skip here. You can do some, okay. You can do some regular physical exercise, um, 30 minutes, five times per week. And I actually work out an exercise plan with them. Ask them what it is that they would actually like to do in terms of exercise. Professor Errol Morrison says that he will tell his patients to walk around the bed a few times. I have patients who will tell me they walk on the driveway, they sweep their yard, something like that. So they bust a sweat as it is. So we do things like that. When you look at this case history, the same young lady, 
you rec we realize here that she doesn't exercise at all. So with her, one of the things that I had to recommend her was a regular physical exercise. The fact is that with the physical activity for those persons with type 2 diabetes, I tell my patients this, that it reduces the risk of cardiovascular sickness and death. And I explain to them what that means. Uh, it reduces the risk of you developing a heart attack. It reduces your, the risk of you developing a stroke. It helps you with your, your poor circulation. So we break it down like that. Of course, in terms of, we know that it improves insulin sensitivity. I would say to them, it helps in terms of how your insulin in your body works. And of course, in my initial presentation or in my, my introduction to them, I would have spoken to them about what insulin is and what it does. I tell them that the physical exercise will help in maintenance of their body weight and so on and so forth and blood pressure and let them feel better. This is just basically the same thing. Exercise, aerobic exercise, 30 minutes, five times per week. Already said that I'm not telling my patients to go and jog on the road. I always with exercise, ask my patients if it is safe for them to exercise where they live. Because we know that there are some places there where it's just not safe for them to go on the road five o'clock, six o'clock in the morning to exercise. So we have to take that into consideration. And of course, strength training, what that means and some amount of stretching, which is very important. You know what I also um, introduced my patient to, those who have access to YouTube, there is Walking with Leslie. That's one of the, that I use in particular. I like to walk along with Leslie and I will explain to them some of the moves that you make and show them that this uh, walking video, you actually just, uh, are using up a smaller space. So you don't need to have a lot of space. You're actually walking within a, a confined space. Eye, mouth, and foot care. As I had, uh, I had said earlier, it's amazing how many persons do not check their eyes. They don't check, go to the dentist. And of course, foot care is a, a big, big issue there. With eye care, we know about glaucoma, cataract, and of course, diabetic retinopathy. And the persons will have to be screened for this. So I refer my patients to the ophthalmologist, those who can go privately, send them to the clinic, we, we send them. And to be honest with you, some persons don't take me on and they don't go, but at least we try. Mouth care is very important. Can get gingivitis, periodontitis, very important that these persons go to the dentist. If there were in dentures, we need to check that, you know, the dentures are in good working order. No, this is an area, foot care, which is uh, very important. At, uh, I would say almost every examination of my diabetic patients, I check their feet. It's like a habit for me. And uh, we also send patients to the podiatrist, Mr. Bernard, to give him a plug of one. I send them to the podiatrist. The clinics, many of the clinics have healthcare aides who have been trained by Mr. Bernard, who Mr. Owen Bernard and team to perform integrated foot examinations. They do this not just on the diabetics, but also on the elderly. 
very important that this is done. In the office, so I'll examine the, the feet. In the office, some tips that I give my patients is important to keep your blood sugar levels um, normal. I tell them, wash your feet every day with lukewarm water. I tell them the water must not hot at all. Don't use no hot water. Because some people come in and they say, you know what? They hear they must use hot water and all manner of things. I tell them, please don't do that. And I explain to them what will happen if they use hot water, especially those who have uh, neuropathy. They can't feel the hot water because that is sometimes for some people uh, a hard moment. You know, you have a point, doctor. Yes. Dry the feet well and they must dry between the toes i tell people don't use that little pen knife i don't know many of you may know have a relative who uses a little pen knife the little knife and they will clean out the inside of the toenails and you know that is a major major issue there the, if the skin is cracked check the doctor do not remove corns or calluses. Avoid going barefoot. I have to be telling my patients this time and time again, also giving them advice about the correct type of footwear. And they have to check their feet daily. This can be a bit of a challenge for some persons because what happens is that some persons not seen properly and some people are not able for one reason or the other Sometimes they have the trunk or obesity. They're not able to check their feet daily. So as much as possible, they can get somebody to check their feet for them. I say, do that or get a mirror and uh, look, use the mirror to inspect the bottom of your feet. Or in Jamaica, we say foot bottom. And if there is a problem, chop, chop to the doctor and check that out. Things that they must wear, shoes that fit well, use cotton socks to absorb moisture. And before putting on shoes, they must put their hands inside of the shoes to check for any gravel or for any torn linings. What not to wear, well, lovely pair of shoes. Well, the, the shoes with the high heels, no, no. Those, you know, with the pointed toes and so on, they're going to put too much pressure on parts of the foot and they may cause ulcers. Shoes without any socks or stockings and socks with elastic bands and garters at the top, or, you know, the socks with the seams. So now we're getting now into a whole different aspect, the one that people want to know. So you look at this burger, the Whopper. People will be asking, so what do I eat? That usually is the first thing that people, people will say, what are going to eat now? The fact is that food is the cornerstone of diabetes care. No, it was uh, not Monday, not what well, today's Monday. It was last week, Monday. I had the privilege of joining the Jamaica Observer Monday Exchange and speaking along with um, Dr. Julia Rowe Porter from the Ministry of Health and Wellness and other persons such as Professor Marshall Toller Reed, um, nurse from the Diabetes Association of Jamaica, and a young lady who had type who has type 1 diabetes. No, I'm quoting here from or highlighting something that uh, things that Dr. Ro Porter had said and is quoted in the in the Jamaica Observer last Tuesday's Jamaica Observer. And here she says that consuming high calorie foods, packaged processed foods that have a high glycemic index instead of those foods that take long to, to prepare, 
like ground provisions are causing a challenge. They're burning out your, your pancreas. It's very important that we get this message across to our patients. Very important that we get it across to our patient in our own different ways. Further, Dr. Roe Porter said that there is no diabetic diet and, uh, and people and how people with diabetes should eat is really how all of us are supposed to eat. And I'll go into this in a little bit more. And she further said that all of us are supposed to be eating healthily. So what happens is that culturally, we need a shift. We need a shift in terms of appreciating what a healthy meal ought to look like. Because the fact is that many persons are overweight or they're obese and we know that this is a risk for the development of diabetes so the goals of healthy meal planning would be to and this is something as i said we're talking to patients about eat nutritious food of course my idea of what is nutritious may be different from another person's idea so we have to ensure that we're on the same page, what nutritious really means. Achieving our desirable body weight. For each patient, I calculate their body mass index and explain to them what that really means. And of course, we're talking about normal again, normal cholesterol and triglyceride levels to prevent complication. I had to take this picture. Now, in our practice, um, what we do is that we have uh, various uh, containers uh, with, uh, with uh, drinks. So on one side, maybe I should have hidden the, the logo for the Pepsi, but it's just between us here and the crown water. So what you have to do, what I do, is that I teach my patients, I inform them that this, for example, this drink, a particular drink, I'll ask them, what is it that you love to drink? And the thing is that many of my patients will tell me that they will drink two or three of these in one setting. And I'm always saying, that's very interesting. And I say, you know that this contains 17 teaspoons of sugar. And they're saying, really? But it not really tastes sweet. I'm sure all, most people here listening have had that experience. So what I do is that I have to teach my patients how to read food labels. So I say to them, you see, you see what I'm showing you here? Um, Dr. Taylor Byron, Carlin, she's the pediatrician. So what Carlin did is that she has actually in each bottle, this is the Fran water one, she has actually put in the amount of sugar. So this has in 17 teaspoons of sugar. So what I have to do is I show the patient 17 teaspoons of sugar here. And I say to them, look on the back. It says here, amount per serving. So I show them that each, this bottle has 2.5 serving. So I said to them, for me, for you, and somebody else. And I calculate, with their help, of course, the amount of sugar that is in this. This is what we call an aha moment. Because many persons will say things like, say, the flavored waters, they will say, but it not have been no sugar, doctor. And I will calculate for them so that they are aware of what they are putting in their bodies and they can make a decision as to what it is that they actually want to continue to have. So just briefly here, um, just looking at this, you know, we're looking at medical nutrition therapy, the Diabetes Association, or, um, the American Diabetes Association, I almost said Diabetes Association of Jamaica, uses the term medical nutrition therapy to describe this, um, coordination of dietary intake with diet, diabetic therapy, which is not just non-pharmacological, but pharmacological. 
to obtain favorable response. So this is what I really want to say about the, the medical nutrition therapy. And you have primary, you have a secondary prevention, and you have tertiary prevention, which are all very important. Now, the medical nutrition therapy improves not just the diabetes, but it also improves hypertension, dyslipidemia, and obesity. The things that we are saying we want normal of. And the diets with low glycemic index foods actually reduce the, the postprandial surges that we, we can see. Of course, we need to encourage patients to increase their daily intake of fiber. The diabetes, I want to point out this here, the diabetes specific formulae, which have been adopted by medical nutrition therapy, causes significant reduction in glycosylated hemoglobin levels, postprandial glucose levels. So it actually does what we want it to do for our patients. The Mediterranean diet, I know Dr. Bucklon um, is a fan of this particular diet, is associated with largest reductions in glycosylated hemoglobin and body weight. So the Mediterranean diet comprises of high amounts of olive oil, veg, legumes, whole grains, very nutritious foods. So when you break this down and you know, I talk to my patients about what they eat. My patients, it's amazing how many of them will tell me, I really, they hate vegetables. Up to last week, I had to be encouraging a lady in her 60s to eat vegetables because she's diabetic and her sugars are not controlled. She hates vegetables. I even ended up giving her recipes on how to really incorporate vegetables into her, her diet. I told her about how to make a vegetable casserole. Can't tell you about that at anybody who wants to, to know. But this is the Mediterranean diet here. But now let us look at uh, our Jamaican diet a recommendation this is actually let me go for more props this is actually this if you can see it um it was created by miss andrea hunt who is a well-known diabetes educator i i refer some of my patients to her and there's another diabetes educator mrs michelle isaacs so if you look on this plate here, you will see that literally half of the plate is a veg and you have a piece of chicken here and you have a little bit of rice. But many of our patients, you'll find that the plate is not the same way like this. So many of our patients where you see the, the um, veg, is where you actually see the rice and then know they have a little piece of tomato, you know, a little chips of tomato, as we would say, and that is what they eat. So what we have to do is to help patients to sort of change the way they eat. Yes, I know that vegetables are expensive. Yes, I know that food is expensive, but this is where we can, for example, encourage our patients to start to a vegetable garden, get two pot, get two car tire or something, grow some callaloo or some pak chow or something or the other. So it improves what it is they're eating. But so we're looking at this like this. I show this to my patients all the time. I also show them this. This is a plate. You'll notice that this plate I have here, vegetables, I have protein and the carbs. So the patients, they're seeing this, which is one dimensional and they're actually seeing this plate. So they're actually seeing how much the rice is. 
So I, I will talk to them about things like that. I tell them that, you know, honestly, when you're eating rice, it should be half a cup, shouldn't be more than half a cup. And I say to them, it's not half of your teacup because your teacup different from my teacup. So, you know, it should be a, a half of a cup that you bake with. And then the patient's going to say to me, you know, doc, I really don't bake. So at that point, I take out some other props. So you see, I have a lot of props that I have here and I'll show them examples. This I got from a drug company. Okay. Um, I got from another drug company. So I'll show them what a portion really is. So a portion, for example, of meat could be like the size of a deck of cards. A cup would be a fist. A teaspoon would be the tip of a thumb and so on and so forth. So that is how we help our patient. Portion size. See the big mangoes there when it's mango season. A lot of my diabetics that go out of control. And it's not just my diabetic patients. Most of it happens with the diabetic patients because when I tell them, for example, that uh, a portion of mango is a jaw, sometimes it's like the people want to cuss me, you know what I mean? And I'm like, man, it's a jaw of the mango. And then I say, well, that will just hitch up in their teeth. So we have a little conversation ar around the, the, the mango eating and so on. So the thing is that diabetics and all of us need to control the amount of food eaten at each meal. Fruits. I think I'm, I am, must be on some anomaly. I absolutely love vegetables. I would pig out on vegetables. Not most of my patients are most of the people I should say I know. So with fruits again, we have to explain to persons how to choose fruits. So my patients love them mango and them, them pineapple, two or three slices of pineapple doctor because they say I must eat whole heap of fruit and a banana and so on and so forth. So we have to educate them in terms of the correct choices to make for, the, for them for, to help their sugar levels. And as I say to patients, you know, what you must do is see what happens with your body. Because I could say, recommend that you don't eat more than one slice of pineapple. And then two hours later, you check your sugar levels and you may find that your sugar levels normal. And you could say, she don't know what you're talking about. So do something like that and check. So what I'm doing then is empowering my patients. Again, this is just showing you what a, what a serving is. You notice here that a serving of bread is one slice, you know, like one slice. Um, porridge is half a cup. You know, when you measure out the cup, so you have to be telling patients things like that. When in Jamaica, people will say they eat two crackers, like two crackers in the night. You have to ask them what two mean. If it's one, two, or some people too could mean the bag of crackers. So we have to keep this very, very real because remember that we're there to help our patients. Just um, give you an example. Just Thursday, I had to do a home visit for a diabetic patient. She wasn't feeling well. And you know, my conclusion at the end of the visit, I say, you know what I think happened to you today? Why you felt so sick? I think you ate too much food because her meal, she's bedridden. So what she ate, I remember it was one piece of breadfruit, two thing of banana, a slice of yam. I think I missed out something in addition to her meat. So she that was one meal. Another meal was something else. So by the time I reached there in the evening, she had consumed maybe three times that. So I think that was what was caused her to throw up. So again, we're looking at all of these here. A serving, half a cup of ice cream, half a cup of ice cream, 
not the full container of ice cream, and so on and so forth. We're looking here at fats and nuts. I remember years ago, I met uh, someone in Trinidad, and she said to me, you know, Jackie, my nutritionist, the American Trinidadian, told me that I can eat peanuts, but I must just eat six. So she was eating one, two, three, four, five, six little nuts. And I was looking at her. She was eating her peanuts, six. Some of the tips to measure and control portion sizes from a patient, I will say to them, use smaller dinnerware. It sort of tricks you into, into eating food, but eating less. And of course, as we had said before, as I showed you before, use your plate as a portion guide, how much a protein should be, how much the vegetables should be, and of course, the complex carbohydrates. Um, we know looking at uh, herbs and supplements, it's important to ask your patients these questions. I ask my patients, you taking any particular herbs or supplements? It's not, I'm not anti-herb or anti-supplement at all. I'm not. But I do believe that we need to know what our patients are taking. And the only way to know is to ask them in a non-judgmental way. It was a study by Professor Rupika Delgoda um, and um, David Pickin from Nash, um, Natural Products Institute. I think it was about 2010 or so. And when they surveyed um, about nearly 600 adults and children, they found that about 18% of the population that was surveyed had actually informed their doctor that they were taking um, herbs, supplements, along with their pharmaceuticals. The reason we need to know this is that many times you can actually have a herb-drug interactions or some of the herbs can cause hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia. We know already Jamaican folk med medicine, persons will be taking aloe vera. I mean, I'm talking here for diabetes, aloe vera. Some persons will be using breadfruit, not too sure how they use that one, periwinkle, Cersei, yes, dandelion, and they use string beans. So we need to ask persons what they're doing. And as again, I said here, we need to think about the possible adverse effects, the hypo, the hyperglycemia and drug herb interactions. Very important. Remember too, you know, that although we're talking about diabetes, that many of the patients that we are seeing who are diabetic, they're also, um, um, they also are hypertensive. They also have high cholesterol levels. I'll give you one that frequent people frequently present with. They come in asking if they can take red yeast rice along with their statin. So that's a no-no because red yeast rice is it's um it's acting almost like a low potency statin, almost like lower statin. And so the combination of red yeast rice along with say um any other statin, a torva statin, rosuva statin, simva statin can give rise to rhabdomyolysis. So we have to watch out for things like that. There are some supplements too that would be recommended for diabetics, the multivitamins, antioxidants, omega-3 fatty acid, B-complex, especially my patients who are taking metformin because the studies are showing that 
persons who take metformin long-term can actually um, have decreased levels of B-complex. I like my patients to take magnesium. Magnesium is actually my favorite mineral there. So there are many things that we can recommend for our patients. This one is, uh, as uh, former President Trump would say, a biggie. Stress management. Think about it. May I, many of our patients are under tremendous stress, whether it's going to be financial stress, family stress, the under the stress of the violence that we see, which is a, an epidemic in our country. We need to speak about stress management and it's uh, the, the, the link between stress and diabetes. We know about the increase in cortisol level. You know, when this was brought over to me was a few years ago when I was taking a history from a gentleman who had was seeing him for the first time, meeting him for the first time. And I asked him, how long have you been diabetic, sir? And he says, since my 16 year old daughter was murdered. So a, a gentleman like that to treat him and to treat his diabetes, to manage his diabetes, is not a question of writing a prescription and saying, all right, sir, go on your ways. We have to look on the entire person. So we have to have a holistic view of, uh, of this, uh, of this uh, gentleman and many, many of our patients. Look on them as holistic, in a holistic manner. So what has worked for my patients, all of what I've just said to you. I know some people will be asking, but you do all of that at once? No, it's not going to be possible. And people are not going to sit down so long. So it's a question of continuous sensitization. You start with a little here, the pertinent um, information. And then as time goes by, you give the person more information, you reinforce and so on and so forth. What has worked for my patients, as I said, all of the above, we used to have weekly diabetes education classes for the community. Anybody who is diabetic could just come, sit down on the veranda, and um, people would just, uh, somebody from my office uh, who used to work as a community health aide, she would take the, the, the classes, and the people used to love it. That they wouldn't have, don't have to be my patients, just anybody at all. What I do know, that was pre-COVID. What we do know is that uh, we refer to a diabetes educator, although a lot of times the people will not take me on, but those who go to the diabetes educator, they see the value in it. And of course, I do a good amount myself. And of course, I have the persons reading a copy that I wrote, a patient's guide to the treatment of diabetes, which basically all the information that I just spoke about, it has that information in it. And of course, you can recommend a book to a patient, you know, and uh, that doesn't mean that the patient is going to read it. So we do what we can do as much as we can do. So thank you for your attention. If you have any questions or comments, please let me know. Thank you so much, Dr. Jackie. I think one of the stressors that I bring up right now would be climate change and how yes. we do climate adaptation because it gets really hot. The people sweat and get dehydrated. They may not get access to the right foods because of lack of certain foods, food availability. Then during flood times, things get washed away. And the whole, the whole, the way construction is occurring, where we have so much concretization of the earth. Yes. And then the place gets 
they're hot. And the way the houses are being built, they, they, the roofs are so low. People get, it's, it's like they're going to bake inside the house and diabetics may live in the house. You know, um, these are real concerns. So I want to just throw that over to, out to you that it is truly a real stress the way climate change is, has occurred. Um, and it is something we have to deal with and how we're going to talk to our patients about it and how they're going to adapt, how they, how they need to adapt and what they've done before and what maybe they could suggest that they could do. Well, it, it, it is, as you say, a real problem. So the thing with me, one of the things I do with the patients is that I will ask them, do you have a, are you staying inside the house for the whole day? Many of them will say, no doctor will sit on the veranda. So at least when they sit on the veranda, they get some cool breeze coming in. They were talking about the elderly persons there, ensure that they're getting adequate amount of water. Getting sunlight is very important, vitamin D. And I tell them, you know, you, they don't want them to bake in the midday sun, but in the morning sun. And we have little conversations like that. But it's, it, when we think of the impact uh, of climate change, it's not just that. We're thinking of food security, something which you touched on just a little bit, really, because it's, it's impacting, as you mentioned, the the quality of food that people are, are getting, the, the amount of food, it's affecting the price of food, so many different things. We should get probably have a webinar on climate change and the impact of climate change on chronic diseases. So, so, yes. so that, that is a, a potential topic there. Yeah, we, have, we have one up in January. Yes, stress. I can't stress the stress enough in that we have, I think, need to be as family physicians, general practitioners, need to be looking at what is happening in the society and how that is impacting our patients. I mentioned the epidemic of violence. It is an epidemic and it is very subtle. So you'll have sometimes a, an individual coming into me and uh, as I said, elderly person, I'll use elderly. And when they talk about their family situation as such, you'll never ever, I hate to sound like this, never ever get these person's sugar levels to go down or their blood pressures to go down. And it's not because the doctor is not say trying to do something, but it's about what is happening to, to this individual. So you really have to spend time listening to the person. That, that is what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you so much. And You're it's uh, mentioned it is important. It's, the whole education involves awareness. Yes. And it is, as you said, aha moments when they didn't realize, but no it clicks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, right, I'm seeing some, some questions here. It says here, um, Dr. Arna Brown is asking, what about food substitution? For going lunch, starch, and so on to enable a slice of cake or a glass of wine later on, later on at a function? That isn't a, that isn't a problem, you know. Once the person has an idea of what he or she is really doing, so you really have to say, all right, so if you, if you want to, let me give you an example. If you're eating a sandwich, for example, how many slices of bread are you going to eat? And the type of bread is not just the slice of bread, the type of bread is going to be important. It has to be a thin slice of bread, not a chunk of hard old bread. And when you do things like that, you may be able to find that later on, if you're going to a function, you can have a little piece of cake once you know how that is going to, how your body is going to really handle, handle that. That is what I would say for that. Another question Very is, uh, can, you give an, can you give any examples of 
herb drug interaction? Um, this the classic one for me is going to be the one I see time and time again because somebody will come with a with a with a bag of supplements that let's just say my daughter sent for me from America. And in it is red yeast rice, which I gave you that example, red yeast rice. And the person is taking um, one of the statins. So that person is at risk for the development of rhabdomyolysis. So things like that. That's an example there. Right. Um, since um, COVID, almost all the older patients take supplements. Yes. So I find I always have to ask about that. I totally agree with Dr. Brown Morgan about that. I, I asked about the, the supplements and if they cannot uh, give me the answer, I ask them to, when they go home, if they can call the office and let me know the name of the supplement they're taking, something like that. So I can make a determination that that is the correct thing for them to be taking. And the interesting mm -hmm. thing, you know, is that some persons are supplementing, but they're not eating properly. Remember that a supplement is just that, a supplement to add to. So you need on, on top of everything to be eating properly. And the eating properly, of course, is a major, is a major issue there. Right. Chantel mm -hmm. Pinnock wants to know where she could access your book. You just need to just give me a, a call. Currently, I have them by, by my office. They used to be in the bookshops. I don't think any of the bookshops have them. No, I have them at my at my office. I can always, uh, you can always get my, my number from CCFP and I can always uh, um, give, uh, give you, let you have access to, okay. to copies of the book for, my, for your patients. Um, you say that diabetics patients should eat food and fiber, but most, well, that's true, you know, we, you have to look on the patient that you're dealing with. So I'm giving yes. some general, I'm giving some general tips. So if you have a patient with comorbidities, and it depends on the comorbidities, trust me, I'm sending them to the specialist, right? Um, but, uh, so it, it just depends on, on, on the clinical picture. Just depends okay, on the clinical so picture. Doc, so Dr. Jackie, foods that are rich in fiber would be things like breadfruit and sweet potato? All of those things, but you mm. know, it, it depends on the degree of renal impairment, because remember mm. with persons with some types of, with, 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 uh, and Dr. Francis in would be able to answer that more fulsomely. Yeah. You have to have them on a particular diet. Let us say, for example, this person has significant renal impairment. If they're going to have any ground provisions, they're going to have to leach it. They're gonna to have to leach the, the ground provision, meaning that you're going to have to ask them to soak the, the ground mm. provision overnight, throw away that water and so on. So it's going to be a process there. So those persons would really need to be um, advised by a dietitian. A nutritionist would have to be the person to guide individuals like okay. that. What type of sugar to use? Uh -huh. um, um, Dr. Booth wants to know, uh, to, asking you to repeat the metformin B-complex interaction. The, the, with metformin, what the studies have shown briefly is that persons who are on metformin for long periods of time, the bodies are depleted of vitamin B. So what I do is that I ensure that my patients are taking B vitamins. And also remember too that many of the persons who were seeing the diabetics may be having diabetic neuropathy. And what I have found is that that works in some cases, um, helps significantly high potency B for the alleviation of some of the pain, the cramping that they have. So it has a numerous effect. And plus many of the patients that we're having, the elderly patients 
remember that the absorptive capacity for B12 is actually decreasing. So you have mm -hmm. to look on it in a number of ways. And of course, my last one on B vitamins is that we should be checking the B vitamin levels of our patients. We should, right. should be checking that there. Um, how would you assist a client who has issues such as bloating and stomach pain when they eat vegetables and legumes? Well, the, the legumes and so on, some things you can soak, you can leach. And what I have found works for those persons is taking probiotics. So I ask them to buy probiotics, go to the pharmacy, I write it down for them, buy some probiotics and take the probiotics every day. So Any particular that, type of probiotic you recommend? Well, in our setting where my practice is, I will just send them to the pharmacy because I know the brand that the pharmacy may have okay. and tell okay. them to, to take that one that is okay. at the pharmacy. Uh -huh. uh, okay, good, thanks. Um, what about intermittent fasting um, to help in controlling diabetes? Uh, I knew somebody would have asked that one. That, that has been working for some persons, especially those persons who are who need to lose weight. But uh, to really answer the question very simply, I would say that if a person is interested in that, you need to be monitoring the person nice. because it's not really recommended that a diabetic who is taking medication should be fasting like for like 16 hours or so. So mm -hmm. you really need to monitor, monitor. the patient and the patient needs to know what he or she is really and truly doing. Right. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Jackie, you alluded to the team approach. Because you mentioned your community health aid giving um, yes. educational talks um, to the community. So this person wants to know, um, newly diagnosed diabetics being referred to psychologists for behavioral interventions, just like we refer to the ophthalmologist. So it's really going to be a team approach. It's not a one-man show. Yes, if uh, some, some persons, you know, they're so devastated, to be honest with you, when they're told that they are pre-diabetic, when they're told that they're diabetic, yeah. that uh, you really have to sit down and listen to what these persons uh, have to say, really listen to them and try your best to help them along. I haven't, I haven't yet, to be honest, can't recall referring anybody to a psychologist for that because what I do is that I make myself available to, to, discuss, to discuss with this person what is happening to he or she. But let me tell you something. It's a devastating thing for many people. I have seen people literally starve themselves starve themselves, starve themselves because they, they just uh, um, hear that they're diabetic. It, it's so they really bad. want to have the understanding of the whole process. And you, um, yes. we, all of us, will, mm -hmm. um, will, will actually collaborate with the patient and take them step by step about how to reach their goals. So we have little and, goals and we reach the goals. And also, who really helps these person is a diabetes okay. educator because a diabetes educator is mm. like a coach a motivator mm. this person the ones that i know they call the patients they call them they have support groups and okay. uh, they like have their whatever day support groups that they they um go to let, let me give you an example i had a patient who came to me her husband had recently died. And she said to me, yes, doctor, you know, so I'm going to put on the weight. I said, yes, you know, and what you notice happening. She said, I put on the weight and I, my sugar levels going up and my pressure. But um, the diabetes educator that I sent her to, she called me, you know, and she helping me. So the diabetes educator is really playing the part of the psychologist there. 
But Beautiful. one, one, Beautiful. one last one here. Um, what's your take on artificial sweeteners? Are there any pitfalls as it relates to their use? I have never liked artificial sweeteners. Right. Because I do, I've always thought that they're acting in the same way as, uh, as the normal sugars. I've always thought so. So I, 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 I've never really liked them at all, at all, at all, at all. Never. Dr. Jackie, mm -hmm. if you, um, I'm sure you'd have seen the, the, um, the comments also that um, everybody appreciated the presentation. Thank you. kept you. it real. Jackie, you kept it really real and we appreciated that about you. And Thanks. so, you know, thank you very much for your approach in the lifestyle management of diabetes mellitus in the general oh. practitioner's office. So at this time, I'm going to invite the sponsor to bring on the presentation video. Thanks for your comments. Sit tight. Don't even take a bite. You don't want to miss the opportunity to win a prize in our Apotex Spotlight. Bacterial infections are one of the most common complaints you'll come across. In fact, according to the American Thoracic Society, Infectious Diseases Society of America 2019 guidelines, community-acquired pneumonia remains one of the leading causes of deaths in the world. In 2020, the World Health Organization estimated 374 million new infections with one of four STIs, including chlamydia, 129 million cases, gonorrhea with 82 million cases, syphilis at 7.1 million cases, and trichomoniasis with a whopping 156 million cases. Today, we will go ahead and look at our Apple antibiotic solutions, categorized in four categories, including our Apple macrolides, which includes our Apple azithromycin 250 tablets, and our Apple clarithromycin 500 and 500 milligram XL tablets or fluoroquinolones, including our apolivofloxacin 500 and 750 milligram tablets, or tetracycline, including our apodoxycycline 100 milligram capsule, or nitromidazoles, including our apometronidazole 250 tablets and 500 milligram capsule. In the outpatient setting, our apodoxycycline is recommended along with our macrolides, apoazithromycin and apoclarithromycin, or clarithromycin XL as first-line treatment with patients with CAPD. In the same population, our patients with comorbidities such as chronic heart, lung, liver or renal disease, as well as diabetes mellitus and alcoholism, or apolivofloxacin is recommended. Just to note, the 750 milligram apolivofloxacin offers a unique advantage of increased patient compliance due to a shorter duration of therapy. Helicobacter H. pylori infections remain one of the most common chronic bacterial infections affecting humans that causes peptic ulcer disease and gastric cancer. However, all patients with active peptic ulcer disease, PUD, a past history of PUD, low-grade gastric mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue lymphoma, or a history of endoscopic recession of early gastric cancer should be tested for H. pylori infection. Those who test positive should be offered treatment for the infection with first-line recommendation from the American Journal of Gastroenterology, which includes a triple therapy, including or apoclarithromycin, a proton pump inhibitor, amoxicillin, or apometronidazole. Interestingly, more than 1 million STIs are acquired every day. The CDC's sexually transmitted infections 
2021 guideline recommends for non-gonococcal urethritis and urethritis or apodoxy cycling as first-line therapy and or apoezithromycin as an alternative therapy. We know bacterial vaginosis is a highly prevalent condition and the most common cause of vaginal discharge worldwide, with first-line recommendation being our apometronidazole which also stands as a treatment of choice for both men and women with trichomoniasis. Examining prostatitis, which stands at a prevalence of approximately 8.2% in men. It also accounts for 8% of visits to urologists and up to 1% of visits to our primary care physicians. Our fluoroquinolones continue to be the first-line treatment in the form of apolivafloxacin as supported by the American Family Association. Why should you prescribe the APO? Well, one, you're assured of high quality. Our products are formulated to contain the same active ingredients and to produce the same beneficial effects as the originator they replicate. Two, you get affordability. Our products are at a price point that patients can afford. Three, accessibility. Our products are well distributed in all pharmacies island-wide. Four, our therapeutic range. We have a wide range of products in numerous strengths and forms. So please remember to add the APO prefix to ensure your patients receive a high quality, affordable pharmaceutical option. Have an apotastic day. Thank you so much, Apotex. At this time, I invite Mrs. Abigail Hay, MedRep from Apotex, to introduce our next speaker. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Buckland. Good. Dr. Patrice Francis Emanuel completed her undergraduate and postgraduate training in medicine at the University of the West Indies, Mona, in 2003 and 2010, respectively. Her interest in research led her to the Tropical Medicine Research Institute and later the UE Solutions for Developing Countries, where she worked on various research projects and which ran concurrently with her clinical responsibilities. So she is a member of many, the member of the many local and international medical societies and has published in peer-reviewed journals. Dr. Francis Emanuel received endocrinology and diabetes fellowship training at the West Suffolk Hospital in United Kingdom. She's a consultant at the University Hospital of the West Indies and associate lecturer at the University of the West Indies. All join me virtually in giving a round of applause and inviting and welcoming Dr. Patrice Francis Emanuel, our next speaker. Thank you very much, Abigail, for that introduction and welcome. I'm hoping everybody's hearing me okay. Hearing you clearly, and we're seeing your slides as well perfectly. Thanks very much. Right, so I know everybody is exhausted. It's the end of a long day, so I'll try to make this as painless as possible. Um, but I would like to start off by thanking the Association of General Practitioners of Jamaica for inviting me to be part of this evening's proceedings and thanks also to Apotex for facilitating this educational venture. So over the next 45 minutes or so, um, I promise I will not go beyond the time, we'll be looking at screening for microvascular diabetes complications. So I'm going to start with a case scenario on which we'll base the, the discussion. It's a 48-year-old man. He's an accountant, has a relatively sedentary job, and has recently been diagnosed with what he termed borderline hypertension, 
um, for which he mentioned he was not started on any particular medication, but he was asked to change his lifestyle, basically. So he comes back to the general practitioner with a two week history of polyuria. So he's passing a lot of urine, he's extra thirsty with polydipsia and also has blurred vision. When she measures his body mass index, it's just shy of obesity at um, 29.4 kilograms per meter squared. His blood pressure on assessment there was 152 over 88 millimeters mercury and the repeat 148 over 84 millimeters mercury. She does his capillary blood glucose um, in the office and it's returned at 18.6 millimoles per liter. And she decided to do a formal oral glucose tolerance test using 75 grams of anhydrous glucose, which came back showing a fasting glucose of 8.6 millimoles per liter to our postprandial of 12.8 and his hemoglobin A1C 8.9%. So all of those are suggesting that this gentleman has newly diagnosed diabetes. So over the next few minutes, we'll be looking at these objectives. I would like us to be able to identify and list the chronic complications of diabetes. Briefly, I'll briefly describe the pathophysiology behind the development of chronic microvascular complications, which will be the focus tonight. I'll discuss glycemic targets in diabetes care, discuss why achieving hemoglobin A1C targets um, is important, why achieving that is important, outline the criteria of a good screening test. And then we'll go on to describing the recommendations for microvascular screening, including the schedule and specific tests, outline when to refer these patients, and then I'll summarize. So broadly um, speaking, the management of diabetes will depend on um, certain pillars. Um, the initial management of individuals recently diagnosed with type 2 diabetes should always entail lifestyle adjustment. And the, our previous speaker did an excellent job in this, this, um, discussing all of this, which I won't go into um, you know, much further. Um, initially, as well, individuals tend to be started on, on a medication, usually it's metformin, as long as they're able to tolerate it, but more and more we're uh, recognizing that there are other agents which can be employed as first-line therapy, depending on what the patient's cardiovascular risk status is, is like. And today we're not really talking therapy per se, we're really specifically looking at screening, uh, but I thought I would um, put metformin as one of the, the, the pillars of initial management. Um, usually we start with low doses, as many individuals tend not to be able to tolerate the higher doses initially. We titrate very slowly up and we monitor the patient's hemoglobin A1C to see whether they are within target within three months, and if not, then we intensify therapy. Um, statin therapy is also a huge part of diabetes management. Um, and in fact, we no longer utilize just the LDL or the lipid um, numbers, but we treat individuals with statin therapy based on their risk profile. So many times the patients will question why the doctor is prescribing a statin or a statin when their lipid levels or the numbers from the blood tests are normal but it's important for these patients to be educated that we're not necessarily treating the numbers or the LDL and the you know, total cholesterol levels, but we're managing their risk profile, try to reduce the risk of their developing complications later on. Um, and of course, we want to start off with doing our baseline lipid levels, liver function tests, your complete blood count and your kidney function. But, Beyond this, there are some other considerations in the newly diagnosed individual, that, that individual diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. It, it's important to recognize that even at the time of, of diagnosis with diabetes, so individuals will be pre-diabetic for a number of years, they go unrecognized because there's no routine screening, for instance, and they might not really have good health-seeking behaviors. So they come to you at the point where they become symptomatic, but it's important to recognize that many times in these patients at the time of diagnosis, they have had macrovascular complications that are already present by the time they, they come to you. 
um, and these individuals at diagnosis may also have evidence of microvascular complications. It's very important that from the time these individuals are diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, that we start looking for these complications so we can manage accordingly. There are several um, mechanisms of, um, well, mechanisms within the pathophysiology of diabetes and hyperglycemia that result in um, an increase in the risk of the microvascular and the macrovascular complications. So there are changes that take place in the nerves, changes that take place in the cells at the back of the eyes, and changes that take place in the kidneys that result in these, these abnormalities that may result in, in diabetic microvascular complications. There are also abnormalities that occur in the, in the blood vessels, which alter the blood flow, uh, resulting in degeneration of tissues, also contributing to the development of diabetes and microvas microvascular complications of diabetes. And this slide is very busy. I don't expect you to remember all of it, but this is really meant to demonstrate that there's an interplay of a lot of factors um, that contributes to the end point. So in individuals who continue to have unchecked and untreated hyperglycemia, all of these um, subcellular abnormalities and inflammatory responses to the hyperglycemia may contribute to our macrovascular complications, which include your atherosclerosis, um, your heart attacks, stroke, heart failure, etc. And today we're going to be focusing on this side of the diagram, screening to detect nephropathy or kidney abnormalities, neuropathy or nerve abnormalities, and retinopathy or eye problems. And again, this is just to demonstrate that we don't wait until the patient is years after diagnosis to start looking for these, that we start aggressively assessing these patients for the presence of complications at the time when they're diagnosed. And this is specifically for type 2 diabetes. Now, the, the question with the term screening is sometimes used very loosely. Um, and I thought before I, um, I go into the details of screening for complications of diabetes that we should look at really what screening is. So according to the WHO or the World Health Organization, there are certain characteristics that make a screening test a good one or not so good. So the condition for which you're, screen, you're um, administering a screening test should be an important one. And there's no question whether any of these complications are important. Um, the screening modality should be an acceptable treatment for patients with the disease. The facilities for diagnosis and treatment should be available. There should be a recognized latent or early symptomatic stage. There should be a suitable test or examination which has low or few false positives. That means the test is specific and few false negatives. That means the test is, is sensitive. It's able to pick up the abnormalities. The test or the examination should also be acceptable to the population. The cost, including diagnosis and subsequent treatment, should be economically balanced in relation to expenditure on medical care as a whole. So for the screening for microvascular complications, we mentioned the three areas that we want to be focusing on. The eyes, essential, the nerves, very essential, and of course, um, the kidneys. And we're going to start, start off with, with looking at eye screening. So this is a very old photograph of an ophthalmoscope that was developed sometime in the 1800s by a physicist, physicist who was German. And he, he was born, I believe, in 1820. I think his name was Hemholtz. But we have moved beyond this contracture um, and this very bulky arrangement to something that you can carry in your pockets. Um, very compact instrument, but a very essential one for each physician to have um, because it's quite an easy test um, as long as you have a chair for the patient to sit in and a darkened room, then this is something that should be done on each of our patients who have a diagnosis of diabetes. 
But of course, the recommendations, certainly by the American Diabetes Association and um, those other bodies, which put out guidelines sometimes on a yearly basis for how patients with diabetes should be managed and screened, suggests that even though you're going to be doing your fundoscopy in the, in the um, physician's office, these patients need to be referred to the ophthalmologists to have their dilation done um, and a comprehensive examination of their retina. And in many cases, retinal photographs are done and sometimes shared with the physician. So this is done at diagnosis. If there's no diabetic retinopathy found, then these individuals should have routine eye screening every one to two years at the discretion of the ophthalmologist. However, if, a di if diabetic retinopathy is detected, then dilation should be done at least yearly. And when this is done, the ophthalmologist will let the patients know how soon they need to come back for another examination or treatment as indicated. So this is what you might see when you um, decide to do the fundoscopy or um, ophthalmoscopy um, on your patient in your office. Um, this is what the normal retina would look like with the fovea and the macula to the left. Um, and of course, the optic disc to the center from which the blood vessels are emanating. So you have your retinal arteries and veins um, and the smaller ones being the arterioles and the venules more, more um, um, peripherally. The other um, picture demonstrates some of the changes that may be seen in individuals who have diabetic retinopathy. And remember, retinopathy can be um, background pre-proliferative or proliferative. Um, hard exudates are these yellowish areas um, and they occur when the vessels become, they lose their integrity and they start to leak certain specific substances outside of the vessels into the, um, the base of the retina itself. Of course, you have your cotton wool spots or otherwise called the soft exudates. And these occur when the integrity of the blood vessel is such that it's not allowing blood to flow to these areas. It, so these are representative of areas of oxygen deficiency or ischemia. There are also hemorrhages. So the changes that take place in individuals who have chronically uncontrolled diabetes would result in a loss of integrity of the blood vessels to the point where the blood vessels start to leak some blood into it and hemorrhages um, may, may be evident when you do the fundoscopy. And the, the final stage is when you get to the point where the patient has new vessel formation. So th th these are, um, you know, a lot of very tiny new vessels on the retina. And these new vessels are very fragile, easy to bleed. And very often these patients may actually have catastrophic bleeds to the point where they have retinal detachment. We don't want the patients to get to the stage where they have proliferative retinopathy before you detect that they have um, diabetic retinopathy. So that's why it's so important to have these checks done every year. So this is an actual, um, actual photograph, retinal photograph of an individual who has neovascularization or new vessel formation. So this is telling us this patient has proliferative retinopathy um, and is at risk of significant um, retinal damage from bleeding onto the retina from traction from retinal detachment. So these individuals would certainly need prompt referral to the ophthalmologist to see whether interventions can be performed to try to stabilize um, what is happening in the retina. So this leads us now to ask the question, when do we refer patients to the ophthalmolog ophthalmologist? Patients with type 2 diabetes need to be referred at diagnosis for their dilated examination. However, if you see an individual in your office, you've done a fundoscopy, you need to send that patient emergently, you know, very, you know, early to see the ophthalmologist if they have any level of diabetic macular edema. So you're seeing the macula here and you're seeing a, a lot of exudates very close to the, to the macula. When this is present, these individuals need to be seen um, quite promptly by their ophthalmologist so interventions can be put in place to preserve vision. 
Also, in persons who have moderate or severe non-proliferative retinopathy, which is a precursor, it tells you that the proliferative stage is impending. Those individuals need also to be seen promptly. And any person who has new vessel formation, so I'm not seeing it very clearly on this, but the picture we showed before demonstrated new vessel formation very, very clearly. Uh, these individuals need to be seen by the ophthalmologist um, promptly. Just as a side note, um, because this question is asked multiple times by patients, they might be on aspirin for something cardiovascular. They're told that they have um, diabetic retinopathy. Should I stop my, my aspirin? And the answer to that is no. The presence of retinopathy is not in and of itself a contraindication to aspirin therapy that is being used for cardio protection. Um, as the aspirin should not really increase the risk of bleeding and you're using your aspirin to reduce the risk of other complications like your heart attack and, and your stroke re recurring. So that was um, the investigation of the eyes. We're now looking at the kidneys. And again, chronic hyperglycemia will result in a lot of changes within the vasculature, within the tissues in the kidneys, in the, in the glomerulus, et cetera, resulting in specific changes that, res that result in nephropathy. And by no means do I expect you to remember all of this, but this is really just to demonstrate that there are multiple arms that are playing a role, all of them culminating in diabetic kidney disease. Now, these are some statistics that I thought um, were important to highlight here. We know that diabetes is one of the leading causes of chronic kidney disease worldwide. Um, the, the prevalence of end-stage kidney disease is up to 10 times higher in individuals who have diabetes. About eight in every 10 cases of end-stage kidney disease are caused by diabetes, hypertension, or a combination. And that certainly is true for us locally and in the region. And screening for albuminuria should be done every year after diagnosis in people with type 2 diabetes, um, forgive the typo. And the same should be done after five years in individuals who have been diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. And we'll get a little bit more detailed very shortly. So chronic kidney disease, we, we, we know is present when there's persistent elevation of urine albumin levels, um, what we call albuminuria, in the presence of a persistently reduced GFR, which can be calculated or measured, um, and other manifestations of, of kidney damage. We're going to be focusing on the first two. CKD attributable to diabetes typically will develop after a duration of five years in individuals with type 1 diabetes, but may be present, as we mentioned before, at diagnosis for those with type 2 diabetes. CKD due to diabetes can progress to end-stage renal disease, and this is a stage where we don't want our patients to get because we know all the issues associated with dialysis and um, kidney transplantation. So you want to get the patients at the early stage where they're just demonstrating albuminuria and you take the necessary steps to try to reverse this albuminuria. We also are very familiar with the fact that CKD attributable to diabetes markedly increase cardiovascular risk. And in fact, the most common cause of death in CKD patients is cardiovascular disease. So how do we approach screening for diabetes, um, kidney disease? In persons who have type 1 diabetes, we wait until they're five years because it typically takes that amount of time for individuals to develop the microvascular complications. But once individuals get to five years, we want to start doing our annual albumin in urine. So we're checking the albumin to creatinine ratio. And this is done just by asking the patients to go to the lab and collecting urine in a container. You don't no longer have to send these patients to do 24-hour urine collection. 
checking the album into creatinine is quite accurate and easy to perform, and the patients will be much more compliant in collecting the sample than the 24-hour very arduous um, option. For those with type 2 diabetes, again, we can't emphasize this too much. At diagnosis, we need to start screening individuals and then at least annually. Um, don't forget that chronic kidney disease in diabetes is not necessarily screened by the kidney blood tests. So these patients, yes, they need to have urea and electrolytes done, but that is not sufficient for screening because very often these patients have excellent creatinine, excellent urea, excellent blood kidney tests, but, but they're albuminuric. So when you do your urine albumin to creatinine, they're spilling a lot of protein in the urine. And if this is left unchecked, then these patients will continue to deteriorate from a kidney function perspective. In those individuals who have macroalbuminuria, which is defined as having a urine albumin to creatinine more than 300 milligrams per gram, or and or if they have a GFR of between 30 and 60 mils per minute, then they need to be screened even more frequently. And we typically want more than one sample to definitively say these patients have albuminuria. This I found to be quite useful. Um, and this is a diagram taken from the Kendigo guidelines, which um, tabulates how we would define the level of chronic kidney disease or the stage of chronic kidney disease that individual patients have. So no longer are we just using the EGFR, but we're also combining the findings on the albumin to creatinine ratio. And for persons who have um, an EGFR of more than or equal to 90 and, and normal albumin in the urine or urine albumin to creatinine ratio, which is less than 30 milligrams per gram, or in individuals who have a mildly decreased EGFR of between 60 and 89 and normal albumin to creatinine ratio, then screening these persons once a year is sufficient. So these numbers are dictating how many, how many times a year we should be screening the patients. But as the EGFR starts to fall and as the albumin to creatinine ratio starts to rise, you will find that the suggestion for screening tests is going to increase because as, these, the, as this falls and as this increases, the risk of progression of chronic kidney disease increases. Um, and you're seeing those individuals who um, are in the stage where they're G4, where their EGFR is between 15 and 29, irrespective of their albumin um, excretion, they need to be screened frequently and certainly referred to the nephrologists, okay? So as the numbers start to dip and as the albumin excretion starts to increase, the threshold for referring to your nephrologist should, um, should lower. So that was the eyes and that was the, the kidneys. We're looking now at the nerves. And many patients are um, really debilitated by diabetic neuropathy. Um, this is something that will reduce person's quality of life significantly. So it's not to be overlooked at all. So the feet are very important. A comprehensive foot examination or evaluation is needed at least once a year when you see your individuals with diabetes. We start with once a year at diagnosis for those with type two. Um, but as mentioned, for those with type one diabetes, microvascular complications take a little longer to, to, um, to show their heads. And so the screening should certainly start by the time they get to the fifth year after their diagnosis. So for this, um, the history is um, of extreme importance we need to make sure we obtain a comprehensive history from these patients. You want to know whether they have had ulcerations of their feet in the past, whether they've had any amputations, toe amputations, whatever amputations it is to the, to the limbs. If they have a history of shark or foot, which is something you might be able to detect when you examine the patient. This is something we call the rock or bottom foot when it gets really severe 
where the patients, the, 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 the deformities are quite evident, but certainly you don't want to wait until the patients have severe charcoal foot to be able to detect it. These patients may come to you with pain, swelling, redness um, to the feet. And if you have the capacity to check the temperature of the feet in some foot centers, we do have that. There's a discrepancy in temperature. So very often one might believe that this is um, a cellulitis or a foot infection, when in fact it isn't. Um, and the management is going to be totally different. Um, we want to know if these individuals have ever had angioplasty for peripheral arterial disease or any other vascular surgery to their feet, whether it's um, bypass or stenting, if they smoke cigarettes, they have a history of retinopathy or renal disease. We know that these patients have at-risk feet and need to be um, carefully managed and monitored. If they have had a history of, an, of ulceration, whether it's healed or not, or if they've had an amputation in the past, whether it's transmitted tarsal, whether it's a toe amputation, these feet need to be examined at each and every visit. You also need to assess whether they have current symptoms of neuropathy. So do these patients have pain? Do they have burning or numbness? And of course, when it comes to vascular disease, which is a macrovascular complication, you want to know if they have intermittent claudication. So the patients may admit to you that they have pain in the calves when they walk, but then when they rest, the pain goes away. But when it gets quite severe, these individuals may have rest pain and find that sometimes they have to sit on the side of the bed in the night, hang their legs over to relieve this pain. So it's very important to take a comprehensive foot history in our patients. When you're examining, you need to inspect the skin, you assess for foot deformities and do your neurologic and vascular assessment. So the screening, of course, as mentioned, we like to repeat it, type two diabetes at diagnosis and type one diabetes starting at five years um, after diagnosis. So when you're assessing these patients for a neuropathy, you need to check the different modalities. Remember that there are multiple nerves in the feet, multiple nerves all over the body and different nerves will serve different functions. So typically in individuals with diabetic nephropathy, we tend to find that the larger fibers become affected first. So if you're not checking your vibration and position sensation, then you might miss the fact that this individual has early neuropathy. So they may not have the symptoms when you ask them. They have no pain, no numbness, no tingling, no burning. But when you do your, um, your tuning fork test, you might find that they have vibration impairment or when you check for position sensation of the big toe, you find that that is lost as well. In addition to that, um, you need to also check um, pinprick sensation. Temperature sometimes is a little bit difficult in the office because you may not have um, all that you need, um, but certainly checking pinprick sensation will assess the smaller fibers and their function. You also want to, um, to ensure that you use the appropriate tuning forks. I'm not gonna go through all of this. Uh, it's the 128 Hertz tuning fork that we use to assess vibration sensation. And of course we do it on the bony prominences. A monofilament I believe is something every general practitioner should have. Um, this is an example of just what one of them looks like. It's a 10 gram monofilament and it is used to assess sensation at specific points on the feet. And these are demonstrated in this um, slide here. So we want to make sure we assess all 10 points. We want to go on the, this is a plantar aspect of the patient's foot, the hallux, the third digit, as well as the fifth in these three locations, the metatarsal heads, four, five, and six, Midfoot, plantar seven and eight, the heel nine, and then you turn the patient, you go to the, the, um, the dorsum of the foot and you test between the hallux and the second toe at the base. And the reporting, you would say how many of these areas were normal, how many of these er areas were, was the patient able to sense the monofilament and how many of these areas they were not able to appreciate it. And this is a very um, sensitive test for assessing for diabetic um, neuropathy. Um, this is how you would administer it. 
you ensure that it's um, at the locations mentioned and you apply enough pressure to have bowing of the monofilament and you're gonna ask the patient whether they're able to sense that or not. So the question now arises, you have examined the patient. Who are you to refer to the podiatrist and who are you to refer elsewhere? If the patient has symptoms of claudication and we described what those were, they're walking, they have pain in the calves, when they stop, the pain goes away. This suggests that they have macrovascular complications. And while we're not really focusing on the macrovascular complications here, because you're seeing the patient in a comprehensive manner and you've detected that the macrovascular issue might be present, then these individuals need to be referred for vascular assessment. The same goes for when you examine the pulses and these pulses are reduced or absent. If the patient is a current smoker, if they have a history of prior lower extremity complications, and we will describe some of those later, and we've mentioned a few as well. If they have loss of protective sensation, so you've done the sensory assessment and they're not able to feel. If there are structural abnormalities, so the foot looks deformed, it's squeezing up in the shoes, um, or if there's evidence or history of peripheral arterial disease, these individuals need to be referred to the podiatrist. So I find this very um, informative and as an excellent guide to determine which patients will need to be referred on from your, from your practice. So this is um, a diagram which is um, dividing individuals into those who have low risk feet, quote unquote, moderate risk, high risk, or those in remission, and then of course those with active disease. And the ones who are considered to be low risk are those who have no risk factors present. So you've examined them. There's no loss of sensation. They have no signs of peripheral arterial disease and no other risk factors. Then an annual screen by their trained healthcare worker should suffice. In individuals, however, who have moderate risk, and by definition, this is they have one risk factor example, they have lost sensation, they have signs of peripheral arterial disease, or they're unable to, or have no help to self-care, or they have a reduction, a significant reduction in their GFR of less than 15, then these individuals need additional foot assessment and agreed treatment and, man and a management plan by their podiatrist. Of course, you're going to co-manage, but these persons are thought um, to be at, at moderate risk and should be referred for specialist care. The individuals who are thought or said to be high risk are those who have more than one risk factor. So you've examined them. They have a combination of loss of sensation, signs of peripheral arterial disease, callus or deformity. They're unable to access help or self-care um, and they have a re reduction in the, their GFR. So any two of those will define these individuals as, as having higher risk and they need definitely to be assessed by their podiatrist and referred on from you. Those who are said to be in remission also need to be routinely cared for by their um, podiatrist. And by in remission, we mean they've had previous ulcerations which may have healed, they have had an amputation or they have charcoal. And at the top of this is something that we should never miss. So individuals who have active ulceration, who we think have infection, they have ischemia or not, they may be found to have gangrene, their foot is hot and red, swollen. They, those individuals need a rapid referral for multidisciplinary diabetes foot team, which Sad, sad to say, we don't have a structure like this um, in most of our healthcare settings in, in Jamaica, but this is what we should be aspiring to. So these individuals need to be assessed, need to have vascular assessment, and need to be seen by diabetes specialists, by the podiatrist, by your vascular surgeon, as indicated. So we commonly talk about peripheral sensory neuropathy, and we often forget that there's another subspecialty of nerves that are equally affected by diabetes. And this is, these are the autonomic nerves. 
Um, and this diagram demonstrates many, several organs in the body where these nerves are, are present. Um, and with significantly chronic hyperglycemia may also be affected. So how do we determine whether patients um, may have autonomic neuropathy? So this will be based on a combination of the signs and symptoms. So you're gonna take your history from the patient, but there are some things that you may be able to detect when you examine them. But the things the patients may complain of are dry skin, they, they're having excessive perspiration when they're eating or, or digesting their food. They may find their heart racing when they're at rest. They're not really doing much. And when you examine the patients in your office, the pulse rate may be elevated. They may have symptoms of orthostatic hypotension. So when they stand up, they feel dizzy. Sometimes they have fainting spells. Many of these patients may have had myocardial infarctions or heart attacks, and they weren't aware because they had no chest pain. So this is something to always bear in mind when patients come in. Um, without chest pain, they have other symptomatology that may suggest there's some ischemia going on in the heart. Getting an x-ray, getting an ECG, sorry, is very important when these individuals come to the emergency room and certainly doing your cardiac bloods because they might not be experiencing any chest pain at all. In the gastrointestinal um, system, they may have recurrent vomiting, chronic colic, constipation, diarrhea, incontinence of, of feces, um, and of course, erectile dysfunction in the men um, and difficulty with passing urine um, in both men and women. So we have looked at um, the different microvascular complications of diabetes or retinopathy or eye disease, nephropathy or kidney disease, and neuropathy or nerve disease. And the question is always going to be, can the complications be avoided at all? And I included this slide from a, a landmark study, which was published in 1993. It's quite old, almost 30 years. Um, I hope I calculated properly. Quite a number of decades ago. And it looked at individuals. This was actually a, a, a study looking at type 1 patients. Um, and they had two arms, type 1 patients who had intensive um, glycemic management um, and type 1 patients who had routine management. Um, and what was very significant and came out of this study was that once the A1C was kept less than 7%, the, these patients' relative risk of developing um, microvascular complications was quite low. So that's where the 7% came from. These individuals who had A1Cs above 7% were found to have a higher risk of developing or relative risk of developing microvascular complications. And you can see that this risk um, tremendously increased in um, the higher the hemoglobin A1C went. So that's why we're suggesting that for most patients, the A1C target should be below 7%. And that is really if the patient can tolerate it. So there are patients in whom you might attempt to go less than 7%. Um, and depending on what medications they are on, they might have recurrent hypoglycemic symptoms. You don't want to do that to the patients because the recurrent hypoglycemia comes with other issues. But once you're able to achieve this without recurrent hypoglycemia, this is really where we should go. Of course, the caveat is not everybody is going to have the same target. So I wouldn't suggest that you aim for 7% or below in individuals who are older, who had, have end-stage kidney disease, or who have a higher risk of recurrent hypoglycemia. Because the main reason that you want to be stringent is to try to reduce the onset of microvascular complications. And in individuals who already have multiple microvascular complications, the benefits might, might not outweigh the risks. So we're going back to our case scenario and I'm wrapping up here. We're looking again at our 48 year old accountant who is quite sedentary, has um, so-called borderline hypertension, not on medications, newly diagnosed with diabetes. We are going to institute a therapy to try to lower his hemoglobin A1C to get him to target. We're going to be starting a statin. 
um, we're recommending, of course, at the initial stages, lifestyle modification. We're referring him to the dietitian, but how are we going to screen this gentleman? We're gonna have to do a comprehensive history and examination, looking at all the things we um, mentioned before, examining the feet thoroughly, checking um, sensation for um, vibration sensation, we're checking for pain, we're looking for proprioception as well, we're using our monofilament, we're going to be screening the patient by initially we're doing our own fundoscopy, but of course we're sending off the patients to the ophthalmologist for their dilated um, eye check. We're doing our urea and electrolytes, but very importantly, we're sending that patient to the lab to have their spot urine for albumin to creatinine check to see whether nephropathy is present. So this leads us to our summary slide, and I hope um, you guys are not falling asleep yet. Um, we, we recognize that diabetes is associated with microvascular as well as macrovascular chronic complications. These may already be present at the time when persons are diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. These complications may progress with poor glycemic control, and we saw that in that beautiful graph. Um, of the study that was published in the 1990s with the A1C threshold of 7% being associated with a very minimal relative risk of microvascular complications. But as the A1C increased, we realized that that relative risk increased exponentially. Screening is essential to reduce the development and also the progression of long-term complications. And the screening schedule is going to now be based on whether you have type 2 or type 1 diabetes, you're starting that screening at diagnosis for persons with type 2 diabetes, but then at five years in individuals who are diagnosed with type 1, you want to start ensuring that you screen these individuals, irrespective of their age, to be quite honest. And then you refer the patients as we discussed. I think that brings me to the end of the presentation. I thank you for your attentiveness, and I'll take any quest questions now. Thank you very much, Dr. Patrice. I have um, two questions so far. It's, um, Dr. Mitchell is asking, do you recommend persons to one, do their follow-up with a private physician or two, to do their follow-up at the healthcare center or clinic settings? Um, thank you, Dr. Mitchell, for that question. I have no preference, to be honest. Um, what we're promoting is access to care. And wherever that access, wherever that care is accessible, then that is where the patient should, should go. Um, we do know that um, in our setting locally, there isn't um, you know, national, a national government-based insurance system and and We've meant it has been mentioned in 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 this forum um, a number of barriers sometimes that patients are faced with and cost of healthcare is certainly one of them and so if there's a health center close to the individual where um, you know a, a medical officer is is present and is able to carry out all of these. Um, there's no medical doctor in Jamaica who can't take a history and do a good clinical examination. The question is going to now, now be the access to, to the tests. And if you notice, a lot of the testing is actually some um, stuff that you can do in the office. You're going to be examining these patients' feet in your office, and the equipment that you use is quite inexpensive. Most doctors have access to these. Um, the albumin to creatinine, I'm not certain whether it's readily available in all government facilities. Certainly, um, I don't believe it's available in the health center setting, but um, the, the, the government hospitals um, with which these health centers are affiliated would, would certainly be able to, to carry out these tests. Ophthalmology, I know, is tends to be quite deficient in the... Um, uh, I'm, I'm not certain, or I know for sure all um, type B hospitals do not have ophthalmologists. They should be available at your type A hospitals. So some of these services, probably patients may need to, 
to see to seek private care for for access but but there's no need for patients really to see private physicians if if health centers are accessible all right Thank you very much. Next question. Uh, can you refer again, Dr. Michelle Lawrence, can you refer again to this slide where you listed the symptoms of the effects on microvasculature, for example, erectile dysfunction? Right. So erectile dysfunction, um, specifically, I'm not certain if that's, you know, the one that you wanted me to address, but um, elevated, chronically elevated um, glucose levels will result in what we call advanced glycosylated end products. So these are um, situations where the blood blood sugar binds to to certain um, components of the of the the cells um, and circulate, and these may actually cause microvascular damage. So it des destroys the integrity of the small vessels. Um, these small vessels will be required to feed the nerves or the, the, the nerves in different locations. So whether it's a feed, whether it's the uh, male genital organ um, and chronic hyperglycemia will result in reduction in the integrity of the blood vessels, uh, resulting in chronic ischemia. Um, but with erectile dysfunction, you may have larger blood vessels also being affected. So atherosclerotic changes may be present. So in addition to the neuropathy or the autonomic nerves being damaged, you may also have impairment in blood flow. And for men to have meaningful e erections, blood flow is very essential. Um, it's very interesting that you mentioned erectile dysfunction because very often um, this may be a marker of um, vasculopathy overall. So it may be the heralding sign that there's something going on in the heart. So when you say a person with type 2 diabetes or diabetes in general who has erectile dysfunction, it's indicating that you need to address and investigate the individuals um, in a mo more holistic manner, looking at their heart as well, because what is happening um, in that organ may also be happening elsewhere, whether it's in the peripheral art arteries or in the heart. Um, and I'm seeing another question about LDL targets for persons with diabetes. And we kind of move away from the term diabetics, persons with sickle cell disease, as opposed to sicklers, persons with diabetes or living with diabetes for those who've been diagnosed with that condition. Um, and historically, we have um, suggested specific targets. We'd say less than 1.8 millimoles per liter LDL. Um, however, we are now moving towards more risk stratification for these patients. Um, and in fact, um, once you reach 40, 40 years old and you have diabetes, you really should be on a statin irrespective of what your L LDL is. Um, and Apotex has done an amazing job in, in uh, highlighting the range of um, statins that we have available locally and what the intensity of these statins um, are. So your atorvastatin and your resuvastatin would be your high intensity statins. Um, individuals who are over 40 with diabetes should be at least on moderate intensity, which would be the lower doses of your resuvastatin and atorvastatin. Um, however, if these individuals are at high cardiovascular risk, or if they've had an event in the past, then you want to escalate them to high intensity statins to reduce their risk of another event or reduce their risk of a primary event. So we're moving away from looking at the LDL numbers per se and trying to stratify our patients into low risk, moderate or high risk patients and treating them accordingly. All right, thanks. Um, there's another question from Dr. Cunningham, about, yeah. is there any research showing a relationship between uncontrolled diabetes and BPH? I'm not aware of that, Dr. Montague. You're sending me to go and do some reading now. Um, benign prostatic hyperplasia, we know, is relatively common as we age. Um, these individuals would present and complain of lower urinary tract symptoms, so your frequency, hesitancy, dribbling, etc. cetera. Um, Association with diabetes, I'm not certain. And I know of the association between erectile dysfunction and 
cardiovascular disease, but, but I'll certainly be going back to the books to see whether I can answer that question. Thank you so much. I don't see any other question. I see. Oh, um, Dr. Thompson McLean, I have a client who is 42 years old and has recurrent diarrhea. How could I help him? Okay, um, thank you, Dr. McLean, Thompson McLean. I'm assuming this patient has diabetes. Um, and it all starts with a history, really, and examination. So you would have to, of course, I'm sure you've already done so, take a comprehensive history of the patient because um, there are so many things that can lead to chronic diarrhea outside of diabetes. So the fact that the patient has diabetes, um, you want to bear in the back of your mind, yes, that autonomic dysfunction and some medications that metformin may do that, but you don't want to miss something that is um, that is quite ominous. So we know that malignancies can do that. We know that chronic GI infections can also do that. And some inflammatory bowel conditions may or may not be associated with mucus or blood. So um, I would suggest that you know, if you're not seeing anything jumping out at you, you don't think it's metformin, you've tried the patient off and they're still having the symptom, then you should probably ask a gastroenterologist to see this individual to evaluate further. Um, ensuring stool cultures are done would be important, making sure there's nothing chronic that's going on, certainly doing your virology because um, retroviral infections um, are, are some infections that may HIV screening would 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 certainly be important, but um, I think a gastroenterologist would would be somebody to to con to um, consult with about this patient. Thank you very much, Dr. Patrice. It has been really wonderful um, to have you present on this topic. You were so clear, and you took us really through some practical ways um, of doing the screening and I'm sure we will make significant impact on our patients so that together we'll have solutions for access to diabetes care. Thank you. Um, so at this time, at this time I'd invite Mrs. Abigail Hay to move the vote of thanks. Yes. Good evening again, everyone. Thank you so much to everyone. Um, I'm here to do the formal thank you as we come to the end of our evening. Um, before I do that, however, I just wanted to mention that we have been doing giveaways in the chat and there are some persons you have not sent us your contact information as yet, and we'd love to have it so that we can contact you for your prizes. So um, I'm Jody Ann McLeod, Chris Ann McLaren, and um, Joseph um, Hall, as well as Jerome Walker, Karis Foster. Um, yes, those persons, if you can just private message us your contact information so that we can ensure that you get your prizes. Yes, so now, as indicated, I am here to say thank you to all the persons that have been responsible for making this webinar possible. I firstly want to start by thanking the president of the AGPJ, um, Dr. Donald Gordon, um, who are coming, bringing us greetings, and also facilitating this entire um, this entire webinar when we came when we approached for this partnership. We are very grateful. We are very thankful, Dr. Aldith Buckland. We are so grateful for you taking us so ably through this um, this tonight and moderating us so well. We want to also thank all of our presenters. Excellent, excellent presentations. I see all of the claps and so forth persons believe it's truly informative, it will have given true information that they can take into their clinical practice. And from the indication of the hand claps and thumbs ups, I can see that it is truly appreciated. We truly, truly thank you for taking the time to put these together and educating us more on these topics. To the Secretariat of AGPJ, especially um, to Ms. Lynn Thompson Hyatt, we want to thank you so much for all of the time and effort that you put into making today happening. All of the organization, all of the calls, all of the emails, we are truly grateful for you making tonight happen. To the Apotex team who have been online um, supporting those persons that in that introduced speakers, Mr. Dennis Williams, Ms. Judith McBean, we thank you so much for your support. And we are so grateful to have you. And 
to Mr. Samuel Heron, our IT person extraordinaire, person that has been helping us, keeping us in check with all things te techno technological. We are truly grateful for your, for your services. We thank you so much for availing yourself and again, making this possible. And to you, our participants, our doctors that have taken the time out of your schedule to come here this evening, to listen to the information, to join us in this webinar. We are truly, truly grateful and truly tonight would not have been possible without your participation. So we thank you, thank you, thank you. And again, to everyone that did something that was here, we are so grateful to you. Thank you and have a wonderful rest of the evening. Take care.